the pandemic and the family demography edition. Um, I added demography edition because I realized there's just an infinite number of things related to the family um, uh, and the pandemic that I'm not talking about. And I'll, I'll mention a few of those later. How might we expect the pandemic to be affecting families in the, in the, in the broadest sense? I kind of broke it down into the direct effects, which are people getting sick and dying within families. Um, I'm not gonna talk very much about that. Um, uh, we don't have, we don't really have data on um, where, uh, we, we can say things about mortality rates and infection rates and hospitalizations and so on, but we don't have data to like put those people to in families or situate them um, yet. So I'm setting that aside. Um, um, I, uh, I, for context, I want to talk about the social metabolism, sort of the, of the, what is in, uh, euphemistically but incorrectly referred to as like the lockdown, but just how everything has slowed down. And I'll talk about that in the, and, tr and try to put it in the context of what might be happening in families. And then the unemployment and economic insecurity that has followed and what has really turned into um, a seismic inequality event. I don't want to say we've never seen anything like this, but I've never seen anything like this um, that I can think of that has been not only this big, but this unequally experienced. And so um, the family consequences of that are only one aspect of it, but um, but the, in this, the, the scale of the inequality event is huge. Okay. Um, so in demography edition of this, I'm going to talk about births. Seems odd given that it is October. If, uh, uh, if you start in March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, we shouldn't be seeing births, um, births affected by the pandemic yet, um, but maybe we are. Um, but we can talk about other things that are related to births like um, contraception, sex, pregnancy. Uh, uh, so I'll talk about that. Um, marriage, we have some good data on, um, uh, including um, from a number of different places. So I'll talk about that. Uh, and then divorce, some interesting, um, uh, very preliminary kind of things we could we can think about. Um, the hypothesis is basically there's less of everything demographic happening. And so what does that mean for families and the future of families and life experience and the, you know, the, the, the after times that we're living in now? Um, uh, I wish I had more wisdom on that, but that's my, my empirical observation in my, to summarize to, is that there's less of everything. Um, uh, the data here is some early vital statistics from various sources and then um, some random other things and then a, a, a bunch of Google search data, which um, I'll talk about the possible weaknesses of that. Um, it's, it's, at best, um, it's at best speculative um, to use that, um, but it, uh, or I should say at best suggestive. So. I think it's suggestive. So the social metabolism, Google mobility, Google puts out this great data, um, which they update every week, which is um, how much people are moving around. And it's basically, um, it's, it's aggregated up from the number of pings at categories of places that they use, groceries and pharmacies, transit stations, retail and recreation, residential and workplaces. And um, they put it out at the county and state, at the county level, and actually for regions all around the world. So I just took the state, I took the counties and I aggregated them up unweighted to create county averages. Um, so don't hold me to this methodology exactly, but I think the point is pretty clear here. Um, compared to the pre-pandemic levels of January, um, uh, you can see uh, that by March, by the end of March, um, mobility in the country had crashed down anywhere between 20 and 40 percent or between 15 and 38 percent or so. Um, across the states. Then you have the big rebound of the reopening. Um, and, um, uh, and then now some are declining again now in terms of um, people staying home more. So this is a general sort of measure of how much people are moving around. Um, you can see some idiosyncratic things that have kind of give you some face validity like Hawaii. Um, um, uh, th there are fewer people in Hawaii because of tourism. So it makes sense that Hawaii has not recovered as much. You can also see that big bump um, in the middle there is that giant motorcycle rally in South Dakota. Um, uh, so you can see some other major events that happen. And, and the states that are at the top now, South Dakota, Wyoming, not Maine, but Montana, Idaho, um, Iowa, these are the places with catastrophic um, outbreaks now. Okay, so there was a huge drop in just people moving around, sort of like social metabolism. Um, I, some other ways I kind of thought like, how can we think about the social 
aspects of life and how just how the scale of how much has been um, diminished. So I poked around with a bunch of different searches. Um, and again, um, let me just say, um, this is not a very, this is, this is for suggestive purposes. Um, I didn't keep a record of all the things I tried that didn't look good. Um, I d and Google doesn't, is not very transparent with how they, how they release this data. So um, let's just say it looks like um, searches for things like breathalyzers, which people get concerned about when they're drunk or pulled over, party invitations, weekend. Um, I think people, um, I was trying to think of um, what people might Google when they're getting ready to go out. Um, weekend, possibly um, they stop searching when something pops up. Um, anyway, so that weekend is a search that has dropped a lot and happy hour just decimated. So all those, I put the line on there for uh, March 9th and you can see the big drop in all those things. You could do a million of these, um, just sort of things that are way off their seasonal, where they should be seasonally um, in our social life. Not surprising if you've been alive for the last six months, um, but just to quantify it a little. Um, more demographic, um, uh, uh, young adults living at home, and this has generated some attention in various quarters. Um, we normally have about 42% of, of people age 18 to 29 living at home. That's from according to the current population survey. And by home here, I mean living in their parents, with, in the home of their parents or the home of their grandparents or the home of their in-laws, that is they're married to a person who's living with their parents. Um, so it should be about 42%. It spiked up to almost 50% um, at the peak in June. So that was about 3 million um, uh, young adults living um, at home that, that should not have been. I um, mean, I don't know, we can't say from this if they were moving back um, or this could also have been achieved just by people who normally move out, not moving out. Um, but um, I think in terms of um, adulthood, independence, um, autonomy, whatever is happening in the lives of young adults, we can say it was, um, uh, uh, retarded in this case. It slowed down. Um, okay. Um, in terms of economic, um, the economic shock, which is also related to the, um, the overall social metabolism issue, these are the um, top occupations for men uh, in the blue and women in the orange, um, just the top nine occupations for each uh, gender group. And a couple things to point out here, this is the percent change since January. Um, in the number of people employed in each occupation. So the first thing is the class um, difference that jumps out. So chief executives, that includes small business owners, uh, managers, software developers actually increased. Um, thank you, Zoom. Um, these, uh, they were much less impacted than the working class jobs, janitors, retail sales, construction workers, that's among men. Among women, you can bracket the teachers because that's a lot of that is seasonal, but retail sales, cashiers, um, uh, 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 customer service representative, secretaries, um, big, um, big drops in uh, uh, employment, which I'm sure most of you know. I highlighted the retail salespeople. There aren't too many occupations to compare among, uh, but to compare men and women in the top occupations because of segregation. But it is interesting that almost 60% of women and retail sales jobs were out of work in April compared to only 40% of men. Um, and now um, it's still 20% of women compared to um, about 5% of men. So um, the other thing to see on this is the gender difference. So women have lost more jobs than men, unlike the man session of 2009, for example. <clears throat> um, sorry, the he man session. Yes, the man session and the he covery that was last time. Okay, um, here it is just for black men and women. And A, um, these are bigger shocks than it was for the general population. Um, and then um, uh, you can see this class element again, janitors, retail sales, laborers, stock and order fillers, um, the just huge drop. Personal care aids, almost 60% of black women um, in those fields um, were out of work uh, at the worst. Okay, so catastrophic shock um, that uh, we can imagine, now we're being asked to imagine what this might mean for families. Um, one more um, take on the employment family interaction is labor force participation. This is a little different from employment because this includes uh, employed and unemployed. Uh, these are people who are neither employed nor, well, people who are employed or unemployed. Thank you. Um, so you can see a big drop in labor force participation, 4% of all people um, uh, uh, age uh, 18 to 55. Um, and then it recovers more quickly for men. This is, these are with children. So these are fathers and mothers with co-resident children. 
recovers more quickly for men. And now the fall decline in labor force participation for both fathers and mothers quite a bit steeper for mothers. So um, this may have to do with um, school and kids being at home um, and mothers being out of the labor force um, for that reason. But um, that's a pretty big difference. So we've got some, we have clear class, race, and gender disparities in this massive um, seismic inequality event. Um, just to zoom in on this inequality angle again, um, the, uh, the US Census Bureau has um, launched this Household Pulse survey um, they've been doing on sort of two week cycles and asking a few questions um, over and over um, uh, and it seems to be pretty good quality. Um, they asked um, uh, for uh, if, if you or anybody in your household lost income as a result of um, the pandemic. And this basically is um, just an indicator of um, uh, 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 every kind of inequality increasing. So at the top, so overall it's about 45% of people, uh, them or a household member lost income, which is insane. Um, uh, um, whites the least, uh, Hispanics uh, and Blacks the most, never married or divorced people the most, poor people the most, people in bad health the most, uh, uh, people with less education, people with children and younger people. So it is, um, uh, um, these are, these are huge, uh, huge numbers of people that lost income and big disparities according to these common indicators. Gender incidentally is a wash on this and I think that's because um, I haven't looked at the micro data, so I'd have to sort this out, but gender is a wash, I think, because you have old uh, women on fixed incomes who haven't lost income and young uh, women, single mothers who have lost income. And so it balances. So men and women are about the same on this. So I didn't include them. Okay. So how do we expect this kind of thing to affect families in the sense of decision making? Um, that's one, one way to look at it, um, is to use sort of this framework of the theory of planned behavior um, that has been applied to families and family decisions, especially fertility, but I, we, can, we can think about it in terms of other family processes also. You have this model of sort of, um, well, there's background factors, the individual characteristics like personality and general attitudes, then you've got their demographic characteristics, and then social context, things like norms and culture and the economy. All these things um, shape uh, people's beliefs. What are the consequences of having a child? Um, how much social support will I have um, for having a child? Um, will I be able to or will be something um, come between me and this um, uh, me and this goal? Um, so what are the what's some of the perceived control um, uh, 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 over the decision or the process of having a child? All that leads into an intention and then eventually a birth. Um, uh, so if we think about what the pandemic is doing, you know, in a rough illustration, um, these are a few of the places where I could imagine pandemic impact, um, emotions, shot, um, income, devastated, the economy and the social context pretty well wiped out, um, beliefs about the consequences, who knows, um, social support out the window, um, uh, enabling or interfering factors everywhere, um, actual control I don't know. Um, uh, do people, um, uh, people aren't meeting, people aren't um, uh, having new partners, people aren't um, uh, in control of lots of aspects of their health um, and mobility and economic um, status and so on. So um, this is just to say like a giant red splotch flies onto this graph. And we, when we try to imagine um, what the pandemic uh, is doing to these family, uh, to family processes, birth and other things. So let's talk about births. Oh, by the way, um, um, this is also an opportunity for me to show off my pictures. So I put the, the um, these are pictures I got from when I came out of my basement once um, and took some pictures. Um, let's talk about births. Like I said, it's too early to see the real birth um, effects, but maybe not. So let's look a little. Um, first of all, um, I don't know if you remember that charming era six months ago when people were saying things like, oh, there'll be a pandemic baby boom because people are all stuck at home. Um, that was an idea, it was a hypothesis. Um, uh, it was not well grounded and I don't think it's going to bear out. However, this is interesting, condom companies are in the tank. Um, Durex condom sales, um, Durex condom sales slumped. Um, the company that owns Trojan, double digit consumption declines um, in the second quarter. Um, and then when they were bouncing back in July, all but two brands, Trojan, one of the brands that's not bouncing back quite the way they would like. Um, we're waiting for the, the Q3 earnings call is um, next week. Um, I never usually pay attention to this, but I didn't know how else to quantify this. So, okay, this is interesting. People are buying less condoms. Um, maybe they're throwing caution to the wind 
and they're just gonna, um, or they're deciding to have children, so they don't want condoms anymore. I don't think that's what's happening, right? Um, so it's a great, actually, this is a great methods assignment. Um, condoms prevent births. Um, if there are fewer condoms, will there be more births? No, discuss. Um, so I think people are not having as much sex. That's what I'm getting at. Um, the Guttmacher Institute um, did, uh, fielded a survey uh, at the uh, end of April, beginning of May. And they asked people this question, it's a unique kind of question, like they basically said, because of the pandemic, um, have you decided to delay childbearing or decided that you want fewer children? So it's different from a longitudinal study that asks people like every month, how many children do you plan to have? So um, take it with, take the quantities with a grain of salt and let's just say it's big. Something like a third of women, 18 to 49 said, either delay or fewer children as a result of the pandemic. So at least at this moment in time, um, a third of, of women were in the category of at least wanting to say, ah, I'm putting the brakes on this. Um, you can see again, um, a, a, the inequality, it tracks on inequality, black and Hispanic women, um, queer women um, and poor women um, uh, more, being more likely to be in that category of saying delay or fewer children. Okay, so this sort of doesn't go along with the idea that the condom sales decline is because people want to have more children. Okay, not surprising. Um, interestingly, um, for uh, they also compared this to a question that was asked in 2008. So this gives us a little bit of a, se a sense of scale. Um, um, the effects, to the extent that we trust this comparison and met the methodology, um, the effects are larger now than they were in the 2008 recession. Um, uh, and interestingly, um, the second panel here, um, more careful than previously about contraceptive use, 39%. Um, more worried than previously about affording contraception is 25%, and then delayed or canceled um, sexual reproductive health or contraceptive care. So um, a big care gap opening up at the same time that there's more worry and concern. So this is not a recipe for um, happy family development in the sense of, of um, sexuality and children. Okay, so what can we do with, um, with our Google data to see if we can track any of this? Um, Contraception. So um, I poke around on the Google, um, uh, the Google Trends uh, uh, website. Basically what it gives you is a score for every search you enter. It gives you a score um, from one, from zero to a hundred um, of, of how much searching, search traffic there is um, each week. So this goes back five years. I just chose a five year window arbitrarily. Um, and then um, uh, 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 looked at items that I thought might be correlated um, uh, in terms of time. Um, so the searches for, and these are the literal searches, birth control, condoms, and depo shot, um, which are hormonal birth control. Um, so um, when you uh, put those, uh, when, you, when you line those up by week, um, each one has a, a hundred in the week when that thing was searched the most. Um, and then, they're, so they're all on a relative scale, like a Z-score type scale. Um, the alpha for this index of contraceptive searches is now 0.7. Um, so uh, what is it, how does it behave over time? Well, um, fairly drastically for this year. Um, what I want to point out, so here I have three gray lines, which are to, to the 2016, 17, and 18. Um, and then 2019 is highlighted in black and 2020 in red. Um, I do that to just show you that we already had a decline in 2019. And this is a theme we have, which is declining fertility in the US. Um, so that's going to complicate our interpretation of all of these. But then a very big shock in the contraceptive search, um, in the world of contraceptive term searching um, uh, in, uh, after, after a March uh, of this year. So um, again, they don't, Google doesn't tell you the number of searches, um, but we can say um, a, a very big drop. And it's not, it is not in, uh, recovered, although it's, uh, it's re maybe recovered some by October. So a lot less searching for, of a people apparently, presumably searching for um, uh, contraception or to learn about contraception. Um, what about sex itself? Well, you know, I think um, uh, uh, Instagram or Facebook or Google could tell us a lot more. They probably know all these things that I'm trying to figure out. Um, and if they're smart, they're playing the stock market accordingly. Um, what would, people, what would people Google if they were sexually active? Well, I don't know, what about problems like premature ejaculation, pain during sex, pain after sex, orgasm during sex, just things that people might be Googling when they're having sex or like the next morning. Um, 
Uh, and these all show um, declines to varying degrees um, this year compared with last year. Um, orgasm during sex, it's not, I realized later, maybe that's actually porn searches. I'm not sure who searches. Um, hopefully pain during sex is not so much porn searches, but who knows that, you never know. Um, but anyway, some, some decline in sex search traffic. So we've got the declining condom sales, declining contraception, um, possibly less sex. I'm sure we could get it this other ways. Okay, so um, uh, all of this may lead to a certain amount of pregnancy. So what about pregnancy? Again, we're waiting for the birth data. So this is very ephemeral, this whole talk. Soon it will be obviated by the birth data that will, um, that will come around. So I did the same thing. I took um, a handful of searches that I thought would um, that would contemporaneous, that would follow, track each other contemporaneously. Um, chronologically, what is the word for in time? Track each other in time um, over the weeks. Am I pregnant? People Google that a lot. Um, pregnancy test, um, morning sickness, missed period. Um, these things held together um, week by week pretty well in an in a index with an alpha 0.74. I um, mean, let's see how this pregnancy tracker behaves in the Google searches. Um, again, a pretty big drop already in 2019 compared to the earlier years. You know we've been um, talking a lot about falling fertility in the country, and a lot of concern about that. So maybe that was just happening anyway. Um, but there's a, there's a big blip on the seasonality, which is that big drop in March and April um, when we don't get the what looks like a normal bounce in March and April uh, for pregnancy searches. Um, so a pretty big drop in the pregnancy searches, I'm not surprised at all. Um, you never know. Maybe people are just Googling other things and not bothering to think about whether or not they're pregnant. Um, but uh, with the sex and the contraception and the condom sales and all this, like I think there's less sex and less pregnancy. That's where I'm going with that. Interesting rebound um, in the last few weeks. We'll have to follow that. Um, who knows? Um, but I think it's getting close to the point where this will all be um, um, set aside when we start to have birth data, which is where I'm going next. Um, what about births? Well. It's too early, right? Uh, it's just too early. I mean, there's no, it's too early, except what about miscarriages and abortion? Um, is it possible that we're already seeing um, a noticeable number of miscarriages and abortions? Um, I'm not expert on either of those. We, we don't um, do a very good job measuring abortions or miscarriages. Um, there's great, interesting new research using, for example, period tracker um, uh, uh, information and other stuff where people are trying to figure out what's going on with miscarriages, um, but we don't know. But it's conceivable and there's a reasonable hypothesis that with all the stress and disruption, there would be more um, miscarriages. But anyway, that's purely purely speculative. However, um, for the two states where I can find um, a regularly updated month to month um, uh, uh, sort of rolling birth data are Florida and California and Again, we're seeing decline in fertility anyway, but these are these are noticeable declines in fertility. Impossible to be the pandemic, right? Unless um, we don't know how big are these declines. Um, uh, they're, they're next to each other. You see, these are on different scales. Um, to show in terms of percentages, um, the horizontal horizontal line on each here is the average annual decline over the last three years. So, if you know, in in Florida, we would expect a decline of about. 0.7% based on just the annual change. In California, closer to 3% decline based on the year-to-year -year change. Um, and then you can see um, what's happened in those two states through September. California just put the September numbers up um, on Sunday. Um, and um, who knows, 10% drop in, in births in September compared with last September in California is pretty large. That's September. Are we already having fewer premature births and more miscarriages um, or are immigrants going home or, or is there some, something else going on? Few, it, uh, but it looks like fewer births. But I think, um, again, this is gonna be obviated when we see probably a catastrophically giant crash in births in December and January and February and so on. Um, so if that happens, we won't remember this talk, but um, uh, I think it's worth wondering what might be driving down birth rates a little bit even now. Okay, marriage. If you were um, if you were walking around the mall on the day I went down to the mall um, in Washington, D.C., I'm sorry that you ended up in the pictures. Um, 
for topics that might or might not have anything to do with you. I don't even know if these people know each other, um, but I just stuck them on the marriage slide. Okay, so what's going on with marriage? Here we have, again, a couple of different kinds of research, uh, a couple of different kinds of data. Google Trends. Um, these four wedding searches seem to be things that, um, that people search around the same time in the wedding cycle, the very high correlation here with an alpha 0.94. Um, wedding searches, uh, wedding invitations, wedding shower, bridal shower, wedding dresses, people Google these things um, at a, in a very correlated um, extent um, uh, in terms of time. So um, how does this scale, this weddings, Google search wedding scale, um, look over time? Um, a catastrophic crash of, of wedding searches in 2020 compared with the average from previous years. There, I just combined the previous years. Um, well, not surprising, you weren't allowed to have weddings. You weren't allowed to have large public events um, in a lot of places. So we don't know, does this mean maybe people were still sneaking down to the courthouse and getting married. Maybe they were still filling out all the paperwork for their marriage license um, and just not pulling the trigger. Or maybe to some degree, um, their relationships were falling apart. Their long distance relationships um, are not working out. They've changed their mind about marriage. We don't, we don't know, but there's a lot less literal wedding activity, at least on Google. That's about as far as I can say. Um, and it has continued to the present. Like there's some rebound after that huge drop that matches the mobility drop we saw earlier, but still quite a bit down. Okay, not surprising, probably everybody knows somebody um, who had a wedding postponed or canceled this year. Um, in, in the land of fertility, um, every for every hundred births delayed, some are foregone, some never occur. Um, relationships break up, um, uh, people's bodies get older, um, you know, there's a recovery of, of delayed births that's less than 100%. We don't really know, um, I don't really have the basis for um, guessing what the recovery on delayed marriages will be. And that'll be a, a super interesting question as we go forward on this. Okay, um, uh, just in case this marriage license was not well correlated with the other one, so I didn't put it in the index, is it possible that people are just going down to the courthouse um, with their marriage license and getting married because what really matters is being married, not the wedding? Um, well, again, big drop. Um, in the in the first uh, quarter of the year, uh, and then quite a bit of recovery. Um, so um, maybe some of these, if you look at the in the in the last few weeks when this actually seems to have recovered, maybe there is um, uh, maybe some people are pulling the trigger on their um, wet on their marriage without really doing the wedding. Okay, but um, uh, and here um, we have uh, Kate Choi in the audience here. Um, I'm blocking the URL with my head. Um, uh, uh, Brandon Wagner, K. Choi, and I have put together data from a few states and written this um, short paper called Decline in Marriage Associated with the Pandemic, um, giving away the punchline there, decline in marriage. So we looked at a few different places. Um, here's Florida, again, Florida with the nice uh, monthly reports. Just going through July here, um, you see um, on the left is the cumulative number of marriages um, recorded by the vital statistics. So that's a drop of roughly 25%. And you can see that difference on the right. Um, sharp decline, a little bit tapering now. Um, so not, um, not falling behind as far every month in June and July as it did um, in, uh, in March and April. Okay, but very big decline in weddings in Florida. Um, Hawaii is an interesting case. This is really big. This is more like a 50% drop almost um, uh, in the cumulative number of marriages in Hawaii. Um, uh, a lot of people go to Hawaii to get married. Um, we have a supplemental figure um, in the paper that shows that most of this drop is actually non-residents um, not getting married in Hawaii. Um, then the other way, um, uh, the other place we looked was Seattle where we have marriage applications. Um, and here it's interesting, the decline is less, more like 10% in the cumulative uh, number of marriage applications. Um, and you can also see that rate of um, falling behind has tapered a little bit in, in um, August and September. I'm um, falling behind at a slightly slower rate than it was in the earlier months. So some evidence that um, the decline in weddings is going to be greater than the decline in marriage. Okay, so maybe some people are um, uh, man managing or deciding to execute their marriage without having the wedding they dreamed of. Um, and in, in that sense, that tells us something about the, um, that gives a, a hint about that some of these lost marriages may be recovered.
right? In the sense that um, a lost wedding may still become a marriage, which, you know, um, uh, we don't know how they will turn out, but that's at least a marriage. Okay. Finally, divorce, with apologies to this couple. They're just walking down the street. Um, uh, um, what is going on with divorce? You probably have seen or heard, if you are paying attention to this kind of stuff, a uh, big news story that broke a while ago. Marriages are rocketing up during the pandemic. Uh, I'm sorry, divorces are rocketing up during the pandemic. Um, I don't believe that. Um, that story that was going around was based on um, um, a company press release that, that sells an online divorce kit, and their downloads went up. But it seems pretty likely that people who are considering divorce would be shifting from in-person to online divorce processing or something. And this company is like a new company. And um, so there's lots of reasons why their sales of divorce kits may be up that are not reflecting an actual increase in divorces. Divorces take time. Um, they take um, a processing. There are waiting periods in some states. Like I do not expect, even if, um, as we have reason to believe, this pandemic is catastrophic for marriages and families and more people want to get divorced, um, uh, I don't, I wouldn't expect to see more divorces yet. Okay, so it may very well be that's not unlike um, the Great Recession, decline in divorces, possibly followed by uh, uh, some rebound as the people who had to put off their divorce because of housing and the expense and the moving and the kids and all the reasons that people who kind of want to get divorced don't get divorced. Um, uh, they, they may, that may rebound when the logistics become more practical. Okay, but we have some indicators. I did a Google, a little bit of a Google an, uh, analysis again here for divorce ideation, people Googling divorce lawyer, divorce attorney, or get a divorce. How do I get a divorce? Um, uh, these hang together pretty well in terms of our index. Um, and the pattern is, who knows, interesting. Um, compared to previous years, there is that decline in divorce ideation, at least as expressed in Google searches, and then a rebound, which puts it above. So it's possible that people were um, distracted and, um, and uh, uh, stuck, you know, whatever was going on, they were not thinking about divorce. Maybe they were just so they were just really realizing the benefits of interdependence and how great their partnership actually is. Um, and then, you know, reality came back or whatever. Um, uh, this is very, this is very speculative, but it does fit my presumption, which is probably why I'm showing it to you, which is that um, decline followed by rebound. So we'll see what happens with divorce. Again, like with the birth data, this is complicated because our overall expectation is um, we, there is a, there's a, um, a time trend in divorce, which is actually down. So I would expect all us being equal, I would have expected a decline in divorces um, because of what's going on in marriage. Um, but uh, this, that may be undermined now, so we'll see. Okay, a little bit of divorce data, back to my favorite um, vital statistics state page, um, Florida. Um, you can see that decline in divorces, um, the cumulative annual total, um, I grouped three-year bins here just because I was going back to 2006 for Florida anyway. So you can see those darker lines, as we would say, it's rotating clockwise rotating clockwise, which means um, there's fewer um, divorces each year in Florida. And then 2020, wow, a huge drop in divorces. Um, these are actually recorded by the state. So maybe they're not pressing them, maybe they're closed. Um, although according to Brandon and Kate, most of the of these uh, county clerks are not closed. Um, but maybe people just weren't processing them or maybe they weren't processing them. So divorces actually went down quite a bit in Florida. Then, however, if you look at, if you track on the right side, the percent difference, you do see that rebound starting. Um, they're not as far behind um, in September uh, as they were in, uh, in August. And, and the, so the, the big drop was before May. Um, uh, so who knows? Um, if, if we see a big rebound um, in the next few months, that'll be pretty interesting. Um, but it still would have to get all the way back up of zero to actually be recouping the lost divorces of the pandemic the lost divorces of the pandemic. Okay, some conclusions. Um, the basketball court um, near my house where they had to take the, um, the hoops off to stop people from playing now, they just play soccer there. Um, so everything slowed down. Um, uh, the question is what's gonna recover in the sense of recouping lost births, marriages, divorces, or whatever. I um, mean, we don't really have the models to, to answer that. 
um, versus what will get worse, like, for example, divorces or the uncertainty and security and inequality issues that motivate people um, to reduce their fertility um, uh, aspirations um, may get worse. The fact that the unemployment rate um, has come back a little or the economic shock um, is not as bad now as it was a few months ago, that doesn't mean that the shock to the decision-making system of families deciding whether or not to have children is reduced. Maybe they're catching their breath and thinking it over and thinking, definitely not having children. So we don't know. Um, uh, and, and we don't know, you know, back to normal is a concept we're gonna forget about soon. Um, um, uh, birth rates were already falling, uh, but I think the big, um, the big demographic story of 2021 is likely to be the, um, the, the very large decline in births. Um, uh, that, that I just think everything points that way. And I think that's gonna be quite shocking when we see how big that is. Um, the demographic things that are, uh, the non-demographic things that are very active in this space that I'm not talking about today, violence and abuse. Um, we have reason to believe there's more violence and abuse being detected less um, uh, and possibly, and, and also less intervention. So detected and um, prevented less. So that's a, that's a terrible story that we, that we can't quite tell yet. Um, the, the yawning educational disparities that are, uh, we're already seeing are huge um, in terms of, just in terms of um, time and attention, um, the kids online and Wi-Fi and all that. Um, there's a whole emerging story about the gender division of labor, which is quite complicated. Um, a lot of men are actually doing more housework and childcare than they used to, but a lot of stuff has moved into the home. The home is generally not the place where you find the most gender equality. So uh, more, it's gonna take some time to sort that out. Um, and then a giant steamrolling mental health catastrophe um, with 11% of adults having seriously contemplated suicide in the last 30 days over like a quarter of young adults. Um, and then the opioid epidemic, which has never gone away um, and which um, is merging with these things um, catastrophically, especially as we're seeing now the pandemic in rural areas and so on. So um, it's a disaster, it's a catastrophe. Um, uh, we're gonna, if you're studying anything in this space, you're gonna be studying this um, for a long time, I expect to be studying this for the rest of my career, um, however long that is. Uh, uh, anyway, so thank you very much for listening. I'm going to turn off my slides so I can um, hear your questions, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you.